creativity. It's always played a central role in the life of our nation. It's our artists who hold up a mirror to our society, reminding us of our common purpose and our collective obligations. Our music in particular has always been an honest reflection of who we really are, a reflection of our successes and our shortcomings, of our diversity, our imagination, our restlessness, of our stubborn insistence on blending the old with the new, tradition with experimentation. We have lofty expectations of ourselves, but we don't often do lofty in our music. American music is grounded in the stories of real people, living real lives, telling their stories, whether jazz or blues, country or rock and roll, Broadway or hip hop. It's rooted in records of slavery and segregation, Dust Bowl and depression, winning wars and coming home, working and losing that proud factory job, tales of hometowns and the hood, always tales of falling in love and having your heart broken. In America, we turn life into lyrics. Listen to the lyrics. If you already know this guy's music, then you're already a fan. Also possibly one of the nicest guys ever. If you don't know this guy's music, then it is my honor to introduce you to a man that I think if we all listen to his music, I think we'd all love each other a lot more. Ladies and gentlemen, Grammy winner, Mr. Kemp Moe. Sesame Streets, there's lots of folks to meet, and every one of them can be your friend. Yeah, yeah there's no need to worry if you're present or you're furry, it doesn't matter in the end. Life is beautiful, life is wondrous. Every star above shining just for us. Life is Somewhere in the world, sun is shining bright. Well, I feel just like you when I cry, just like you. But I heal just like you, and under my skin. I'm just like you Good afternoon <laughs> Thank you, I, my name is Martha Williamson I am a trustee who is humbled and privileged to have served Williams since 2012 <laughs> I'm crying already um, and I am from the great class of 1977. It is my honor um, to, uh, to be on this stage this afternoon and to introduce you um, to uh, the man that Garth Brooks called one of the nicest guys ever, a multi-Grammy um, Blues Foundation BMI award winner, a beloved composer and performer who nevertheless considers his greatest accomplishments to be off stage as a husband, father, brother, and son, as well as a working musician dedicated to the musical education of future generations. He's a musical legend who somehow breaks all the rules of the blues, of jazz, of folk, of country, even gospel, redefining them for new generations while still dedicating himself to their historical preservation, especially the legacy of that uniquely art form, the blues. I've known and admired Kevin, or as he is known professionally, Keb Mo, for more than 20 years. But it wasn't until I began to prepare um, for uh, this afternoon um, that I connected the dots and realized that Williams has a number of connections to Keb Mo. One of them is John Sayles, the pioneer uh, independent filmmaker. 
Um, he uh, cast Kevin in one of his films. Another is our own Tom Piazza, a celebrated American writer on music, who is considered the last word on the history of blues and jazz, having written a number of books on the subject, including the award-winning City of Refuge, True Adventures with the King of the Blues, and the post-Katrina Why New Orleans Matters. Tom's deep affinity with the blues and the roots of American music caused him to be tapped by Martin Scorsese to encapsulate the director's four-part series on the blues with a powerful meditation on its history that begins with its American origins in the cotton fields, first described in 1830, to its adoption by the great band leader W.C. Handy, nearly 100 years later, to its first recordings by the Library of Congress in 1930, through the careers and influences of such varied talents as Ma Rainey, Bessie Smith, Alberta Hunter, Robert Johnson, Hank Williams, Bob Dylan, George Gershwin, Ray Charles, John Lee Hooker, Janis Joplin, and ending with current references to the work of our guest today. In that essay, Tom Piazza introduces us to the blues by accomplishing the near impossible task of explaining them. Tom says the blues is a tangle of contradictions. It is sad and funny, personal and traditional, optimistic and fatalistic, dark and bright. The blues is, in fact, a way of holding such opposites in the mind and the heart simultaneously. It originated among people at the bottom of the American ladder, and it came to be treasured throughout the world. The blues has been played and sung by lone men and women with guitars and by full orchestras, by jug bands, rock and roll groups, jazz pianists, and cabaret singers. The blues borders are porous, and its influence has seeped out into nearly everything surrounding it. It has proven to be so durable, partly because it is not just a way of playing music, but a way of living in the world. It is a reminder of the painful facts of life in the midst of good times, but it's also a reminder that hard times can't last. In the world of the blues, nothing lasts forever except perhaps the constant struggle with the blues. To me, those who have struggled most successfully are the ones who make the hard times look easy and the good times seem almost sacred. And among those whom Tom Piazza credits as not only a pillar in that enduring temple of the blues, whose excellent has, excellence has secured the future of American music as a living and evolving art form, is our guest and Williams College honorary degree recipient, Kevin Roosevelt Moore. very much. Well, now I have to learn how to use my iPad. This is the first time I've ever done this. Let's get those statistics out of the way first, okay? Okay. Four Grammy Awards, 11 Grammy nominations, the Album of the Year, six BMI Awards for your work in film and television, and three different guitars named after you. And I think you were starting to collect those guitars around the first time we met, almost 25 years ago. Yes. Do you remember that? We, right. um, I first heard your music um, on this midnight taxi ride with my husband in New Orleans. And we were sitting there, and this guy comes on singing the most haunting love story I've ever heard uh, every morning. And it subsequently became our song, my husband's and my song. And I said, who is that? Who is that? And the taxi driver says, well, it's Camon. I said, well, it's come on. And I said, I don't speak New Orleans. And he said, <laughs> I said, can you do that slower? He said, Kevin Moore. Ke Kevin Moore. Kevin. It's kind of like Hodor and hold the door. You know, it was like Kevin Moore, Kevin Moore, and it came up. And I said, well, I must find this man immediately. And he says, well, we're, and he took me to the, at me and John up at two o'clock in the morning to the 24 hour uh, Virgin Record store. Remember there on, um, Tower. Tower. To the tower, but tower. was it Virgin? It was Tower first. Tower, yeah. And then it New became Orleans. Virgin, yeah. So um, we found this song, and that's when we became a fan. And then I called you up, and do you remember that? I remember you calling me up, yeah. I was like, well, yeah. yeah. I called you up, and I said, I must meet you now. It must be done. I'm, you, you can't say no. And when I'm, first time I met you, mm -hmm. it was 
Spectacular. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I walked in the room and all of a sudden like, wow. It was like, I, you know, these <laughs> days you have to stop and ask people if it's okay to hug them. But in those days, I just saw this guy walking out of the elevator at the hotel there. And I went, <laughs> and you went, <laughs> and that was that. You know, that was that. And so we, um, um, we, were, uh, we were starting to really work together. And, and I had no idea how much, beyond that song, how much you had done, where you'd come from, you know, what you'd done. And um, I, just, I didn't realize, of all things, I didn't realize the high class list of fans I was joining. And um, we got some of these up on the, on the screen for you, but I'm just gonna read them because it's kind of fun to hear. Eric Clapton, Bonnie Raitt, Jackson Brown, Dr. John, Taj Mahal, Lyle Lovett, Amy Grant, Vince Gill. These are all people that you've worked with. Blues brother, Dan Aykroyd, right? Buddy Guy, Martin Scorsese, Herbie Hancock, James Taylor. Your songs have been recorded um, by performers as, as varied and opposite as B.B. King and Robert Palmer, the Dixie Chicks and Tom Jones, Melissa Manchester and the Zac Brown Band, Natalie Cole and Joe Cocker. I think, um, I think when I first heard that music in, in New Orleans, um, and he, the, the, the taxi driver had such a proprietary sense of you, like Keb Mo belongs to us, he, he's ours, that um, I had no idea that, um, I, I just thought you were born in the South. Um, and it turns out you were born just south of Pasadena, where I live, <laughs> in California, and then you grew up in Compton, yes. right? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I grew up in Compton in the uh, 60s. Yes. Oh, there's a, there's a good time. Well, that's a different Compton than maybe that you're familiar with, but it was the Compton in uh, 1959. I was six years old, so my seven, so six, seven. Mm -hmm. And we grew, we grew up in Compton, and the community was changing a lot due to uh, racial, racial things that were going on in the 60s and things like that. So uh, I, I moved into a very diverse Compton, you know. And uh, so. I left Compton in 1969, so by the time all the, 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 the rappers and the Crips and the Bloods came in, I was mm -hmm. gone. Yeah. But I, was, I grew up in a very, uh, kind of like a studious Compton, you know, where we went to school. I mean, I wore a tie to school. Yeah. I was like, you know, really... Uh, well, you wanted to be an the, architect, right, Yes, I did first. want to be an architect. You wanted to be an architect. So. Well, I really wanted to be a guitar, but I didn't think I could do that. So what changed then? So you didn't... You know, well, um, you played calypso, right? Yes. You played a number of other instruments and, I, I was, and styles I was, of music. I was guided through. I mean, if you got time, I don't know how much time we have. I'll keep talking. But I was, I was, I'm not necessarily the most ambitious person, but I'm very stubborn and I'm very dedicated to what I do. So my friends and situations pull me into where I am right now. Mm. Uh, my first experience with music was my mother saying uh, when I brought the paper home that I'm going to be in the band, you know, bring those papers and you give them to your mom. And she said, Kevin, do you want to be in the band? I said, no. <laughs> and um, she goes, hmm, well, you going to be in it. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my first, like, get in there. And then um, about um, a year later, uh, we moved to a different place in Compton. And I moved to a different school, and the school was a little ahead of my school, and they kicked me out of the band, playing the <laughs> trumpet, because they said my grades weren't good enough. You know, and by, and by now, this, I'm trying to introduce you to the fact that I'm not the most scholastic person in the world. Um, uh, but uh, I, uh, so I had no music, so I was no man. So my mother got me private lessons. And if you know anything about the trumpet, the trumpet is a very disciplined instrument. You have to play the trumpet every day. You can't just go about a week without playing a trumpet like you can a guitar or a piano or something. So um, I didn't practice every day, maybe one or two days. When the trumpet teacher came by, he told my mother, uh, he's not practicing, he doesn't have it. So she took my trumpet lessons away and, my, and the trumpet teacher told my mother, she's wasting her money. <laughs> and my mother was working very hard doing hair in Compton, California to pay for those lessons. So pretty much um, after that, her bringing me in, after that, she kicked me to the curb, you on your own now. So any, any music, music interest I had for that, 
was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> so then you, so then you started, you know, doing, you started playing yeah. in other bands with yeah, guitar, so I, so and I, you discovered. I, we moved again, yeah. and we and we moved. We bought a, went to a house. We were in an apartment. We moved to a house, and um, I knew I wasn't playing any music. And down the street was a Calypso steel band in Compton, California. And the only guy, one of the only Americans making steel drums in 1960, about 62, was this guy named Charles County, right down on my block. And his son, Carlos County, came by and said, hey man, come by the house. And he dropped me and he started teaching me how to play the steel drum. And I would play and his dad heard me because I could play, anything he played, I could play it right after him. <laughs> I had a brain back then, so. And um, so, um, about probably two months later, the, um, his father got rid of all his adult steel bands and all the next thing we were all kids on the block that were playing steel drums and we were called the Young Calatino Steel Band. And I was the, I played the bass pans, these big barrels and I played the bass pan. And for the next nine years, I played steel drums in the band. And so that was what was brought in. This, I'm, not, I'm not looking for this, I was just brought in. And then, uh, Came in junior high school, which is middle school now, so some of you don't know. Uh, in junior high school, I couldn't get in the band. There were, there were no places for me in the band. So I just played the steel drums. And in high school, I wanted to be in the marching band. Not, well, my friends were in the band. Yeah. Lane and Mickey, they were in the band, and they both played French horn in the marching band. <laughs> and they said, um, hey, let's go ask Mr. Thomas if, you know, see if you, we can get you in the band. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I went and I told Mr. Thomas um, I'd like to be in the band. He said, well, you can play the French horn. And he put the French horn in my hand and said, get in line. And I was in the marching band. So the point is that people have either dragged you into music or dragged you out of it, it sounds like. Yeah, right? I mean, pretty much it was, much. My, I credit my friends <laughs> and people around me and some angel that's been following me around my whole life. <laughs> This guided me to music and, and, and made me... The, the, the earliest picture I saw of you working as a guitarist and a, and a blues guy was with Papa John Creech. Mm -hmm. And was that your first job? That was my first professional job, yeah. really professional. I had been playing gigs since I was 12 with the steel band. Yeah, so you yeah. were getting paid to do the steel I band thing. That was I, I, got, I started steel. getting paid early. Oh, that's... Yeah. Good. Wow. So when uh, Papa John preached by this time, I, had, I went to, uh, after high school, the band was over. The cover band I was in disbanded. And so now it's real, a real lifetime. So I had been in the um, work, the uh, vocational, where they put all the people that they knew weren't going to college. That was me. <laughs> they put me in the vocational drafting. And then from there, I went to LA Trade Tech and I did two years of uh, architectural drafting and I, I worked uh, as an intern at a company called Daniel Mann Johnson at Mendenhall doing drafting and running errands. Uh, about for, for the first year, I didn't play guitar at all. Hmm. I just left it at my mom's house and just went and started. And that year, I got in all kinds of trouble because I wasn't playing guitar. I was yeah. just going to school. And so, um, but I got through that year. Should we just skip I, past all the I survived of my youth. Yeah. I got through that year. Yeah. And I started playing the guitar again. Once again, someone called me, James mm -hmm. Speed. He called me and said, hey, man, we're going over to, uh, why don't you come to the, uh, uh, we got some gigs. And so I went and got my guitar from my mom's house. And I hitchhiked from Midtown LA all the way to Compton, wow. like three nights a week to rehearse. Mm -hmm. Crazy. I, I don't know why. I, I mean, I, I think I have some internal thing you in me that just, that just yeah. motivates yeah. me. And I hitchhiked. I got picked up by all kind of weird people <laughs> with my guitar. But I made it all the way from there many nights and back when you could hitchhike. Um, and then that led to once, once I was out of trade tech. Pardon me? Once I was out of trade tech, the people started mm -hmm. calling me again. Mm -hmm. to, I mean, this story kind of goes redundant. It's the same story all the time. Someone calls some, me to come somebody play Somebody keeps here. calling you. Somebody people kept calling, calling me, so I kept going. I'm, I want to. I want to. I want to take a left turn for a second, and say, so when did you start writing? Because I keep. I was listening to what Obama said about listening to the lyrics and talking about um, how 
you know, it is a reflection of who we are and what we do. And I think that a lot of the lyrics are probably, your early lyrics um, are, are a combination of, of what blues, you know, tr traditional blues are, and also your own experiences you know, in Compton and, and growing up and trying to, you know, realizing that it's the friends who have, who have drawn you in, that the guitar itself got you out of trouble. You know, that there's, there's something, um, there's something that's so personal about what, about blues in general, and about what you do. There's a song that you do, um, and I was wondering if you'd be willing to do like a couple of, like a verse or so of it, that's so typical about, that, that just tells me about per personal experience, personal trials and struggles, but it's so touching. And it's, it, I thought of it because you, you're talking about moving around and hitchhiking and going from here to here, like suitcase. Okay. Yeah, can you That's family, family stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's a fa it's a wonderful yeah. story because your family is, you know. Is I have a feeling. Is it true? Would you say that you might not have done this if your mother hadn't pulled you out and said you're on your own? I mean, if she'd made it easy for you, it might not have happened. Well, when she, by her not making it easy for me after that, mm -hmm. I had to get tough about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. You know, I knew yeah. I was on my own, but. Uh, you mind doing a little bit of suitcase? I'd let suitcase. it break some heart. Suitcase. This song is a. Um, This song is about family struggle, relationships and things. And the blues, and the blues, like any good music, you just tell the truth, you know? So, so um, um, when you uh, go into a relationship and you go in a relationship with someone else, you're bringing yourself into the relationship. And, uh, you know that thing, wherever you go, there you are. And there's no, after a you find there's no blaming, there's no more blaming after a while, it's just, it's you. It's not the, you know, you can blame all you want. So anyway, this song's on. So I'll start a little bit. Well, I got a suitcase. was just thinking about uh, uh, something when you when you laughed uh, I mean the blue, the blues makes you cry it tells you the truth and then it surprises you it always seems to surprise you with something and um, I, I I think that you took a you, you started out with those old blues kind of feels the you know the the, the traditional one line repeat the line go, you know complicate the line and then surprises but then you made it your own. And there's uh, one song that I just really think will be a lot of fun that, that follows that, but is classic Kevmo. And it, um, it, it really combines your humor and the sense of resilience, too, which I like, that uh, Tom Piazza calls about the blues. It's, it's humor and resilience and honesty. And it's, um, I like the old, well, I'm not going to tell you. I want oh. you to do it, because that's the trick. I don't want the surprise. I, want the su I don't want to ruin the surprise. Oh, it's, another, it's a love story. It's, it's a love story. I, it's a love I, story. I have to say, my, it's my uh, husband's favorite song, and when you hear it, you'll understand. 
and all yeah. right this is yeah uh, And I'm writing you this letter Cause I'm scared to tell you to your face I like to owe me better Hey, I like to owe me better It was a lot more fun I like to owe me better Didn't take crap from anyone Well, I'd sleep all day Party all night Did whatever I wanted Whatever I liked You made me a brand new man But I like to owe me better I think the first time I made my husband wear a suit, I think I heard something <laughs> along the same lines. Um, the, um, uh, there's a, the, 50 years ago, this week, um, the, the Board of Trustees of Williams College voted to accept women, to admit women. And that began two years later, but, but the vote took place 50 years ago this week. Um, I, I have to say one of the reasons that, that I admire you so much is that you, you take up causes and there are things that you feel very strongly about and one of them is your, your support and respect for women and um, I think that uh, I, I think here we are 50 years later and we have uh, we are about to, to induct our, our first uh, female chairman of the Board of Trustees, Liz Robinson. And of course, we have Maude Mandel. I'm, I'm sure she's here as our fearless leader. And so um, there is a song that you wrote that has come out as a single. It went viral. And do you mind singing a little bit of that? Because I think Maude will get a big kick out of it. This song was co-written by uh, 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 Beth Nielsen Chapman, John Lewis Parker, and myself. And we had to bring a woman in. John Lewis Parker, I write a lot, a lot of songs with them. I played with them back in those Papa John Creech days. And so we were sitting there and we said, we need a woman on this because we can't just write this woman, this song without women. So um, anyway, it goes like this. <laughs> and uh, respecting women always came very natural to me because that's what you did in my, in my oh, audience. That's what you did. That's, that's, I, I, I was raised around women. They didn't need any really uh, liberating. <laughs> <laughs> they, they really didn't. So, yeah. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> you were ahead of the game there. Well, I love women. I really do love women. Way back when, in the beginning of time, man made the fire, then the wheel. Went from a horse to an automobile He said the world is mine He took the oceans and the skies He set the borders, built the walls He won't stop till he owns it all But here we are Standing on the brink of disaster is enough, is enough, is enough. I know the answer. Put a woman in charge. Put the women in charge. Put a woman in charge. Put the women in charge. Now, I know I seem very relaxed, but I'm very nervous. I, you, there's no need to be. Um, mm. I, just, I, I just have one little footnote to the Put a Woman in Charge song, which is that your greatest fan is sitting out there, our current man in charge, who mm. is 
Michael Eisenson, our retiring chairman of the board. And uh, mm. that's a whole other speech I could give, but thank you so much, Michael, and I am just so thrilled to that this worked out. So one little special thank you to you. Um, you know, this is really interesting to me that as, as I listened to, you know, again, President Obama said, listen to the lyrics, listen to the lyrics. And I spent a lot of time listening to your lyrics and watching this sense of social justice increase and increase. And I, I know that you, you um, uh, played a number of roles on television, not just you know, performed music. Um, one of them was a, uh, as a Katrina uh, hurricane survivor. One, um, you and I worked on a show where you played an angel um, singing a song um, that really indicted a number of people. It, was, it really kind of took CBS back, I remember. They were rather shocked, and we said, no, we really want to do this song. It was called Victims of Comfort. Ooh. And it was, remember, it was really indicting the people who choose to ignore you know, environmental issues and current social issues and, and whatever. But again, going back to the women, um, what, I, what touches me is that your lyrics are important and they're subtle. And there is a song that I've listened to many times, but you got something that I didn't even catch the first time I heard it. And it, it is about a woman, and you still do it with humor, but it's very powerful to me. And every woman in this room is gonna get this song. It's about a woman who maybe is in a honky tonk or a bar and walks in alone. Do you mind playing just the first verse of that one? Oh. She just wants to. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Get all my tools together. I, I, you know, I graduated in 77 and then found myself in California looking for a job. And those were, those were the, the real rise. If you remember, like, looking for Mr. Goodbar and all those, they, they were the real rise of, of the happy hours and the, the, um, the, the date, the, the bars and the pickup bars. Were, it was a big deal in that late 70s, early 80s. And, and it, there was a challenge if you and your girlfriend just wanted to go in and sit down and yeah, <laughs> nod and, and have a drink and talk about the day. And a couple of guys can do that at the bar and, and have a beer, but it's a whole different experience for women. And the fact that Kevin caught this moment in a song was, um, you know, you can, you know, Kevin, you want to be an architect. The, the thing that hits me so strongly about that is you can't hum a building. You, know, <laughs> you can't dance to a skyscraper, you know. But I hum this song all the time, and it is very empowering to me. Go ahead. When the music starts to play, she slides out on the floor, dancing. Without a partner Swaying on the two and four There's a rhythm in her footsteps And a flower in her hair Smile on her face She's in a place You know she don't have a care She ain't a looking Looking for a romance, she just wants to dance. She just wants to dance. Go on and let the girl dance. She just wants to dance. Thank you. Here, come sit down. We're gonna we're gonna give you a break for a second. Um, I uh, I know that uh, one of my favorite moments um, and a whole other side of you is was discovering your great passion about creative pos creating positive change through childhood music education. 
and um, that is deep in your heart and you've been involved in so many organizations. And I'd like to take a look at something first. It's a, sort of a song that I, I sort of imagine is the Kevmo brand of helping others by, by starting with yourself. Um, it's, it's again a, a natural evolution. Sitting here in my problem. What am I gonna do now? Am I gonna make it some way, somehow? Well, maybe I'm not supposed to know. Maybe I'm supposed to cry. If nobody ever knows the way I feel, that's all right, that's okay, cause I'm on me. The, the thing that I love is that the blues are not very sad for you. you know, they're, they're, they're all about change. And tell me, tell me where, where does that come from? Well, I, I heard so many times um, people say, I, I like the blues, but they're so depressing. <laughs> you know? And I'm thinking about this powerful medium called the blues. You know, I mean, this, this thing that's so deep and rich in culture in our culture, in American culture, that it's just so, so I mean, I was, I, I mean, it's, a, it's just powerful. So why not take it and use it in the same format and use it in a different way to enlighten and to, uh, um, you know, just, just flip, kind of flip the script with it. Well, you've, 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 not only, <laughs> you've not only taken the music and made it powerful, but that you've taken the result of your success with music and you've, you've made that very powerful. And I was, I was gonna say, I know you've served on the board of the National Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences. You were honored this year as a musical and cultural trailblazer by the National Museum of African American Music. And your album with Taj Mahal won a Grammy last year for Best Contemporary Musa, a Blues Album. And I know you're proud of that, but knowing you and that you're more proud, or, or more, a better word would be you're most content not with the awards you've received, but with the rewarding work you've been able to do as a result of all that. And um, I mentioned earlier, for example, those iconic guitars that are named after Kevin. Um, I know that most people don't know, and what I know you won't admit, is um, the proceeds of that go to beloved causes of yours. Um, and it's a big deal, because those are big guitars. <laughs> so, but, um, but you, but but one of those great causes is music education, and you love kids. Kids love you. Um, I think uh, it's fair to say your musical passion really is equaled by your passion for um, creating music lovers and new musicians early on, um, and you really are inspiring a new generation. And these, you have these amazing efforts that you've made, and one of them is what we saw there uh, with Playing for Change. I want to talk about Playing for Change just a, mil a little bit. Um, what can you tell us about how you got involved? Uh, Playing for Change was started by my friend Mark Johnson, who was my engineer for a couple of albums. And uh, he had this idea, he's a very passionate guy, and he just, he said, I want to go out and record people, and I want to just record people on the streets. So he went down to the Santa Monica uh, promenade and recorded people. I remember he just, just started recording them. <laughs> and, um, and then he just kept, he would have them play together, with different, different people, the street musicians that played different places. And eventually they were played all, over, all around the world. People were just playing together. And so his, his thing was to bring people together and, and use the money, proceeds to build schools all over the world, in Africa and Brazil and places like that, and they're going, they're going well, so. It's established I was, I was, 12, 12 music schools around the world. I was on board well. from the beginning, so I just said, hey, whatever you want to do, I'm on board, just, and he just went out and he calls me up, can you help me? And I just say yes, and once again, this, 
this ever recurring theme in my life of people pulling me in. <laughs> I can't sit and take credit for like that. I have all these ideas about I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. I don't. But what I do have underlying is an intention in my heart and in my soul that I made a deal with the universe, those people, that whatever I do, that it be for something greater than myself. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but that it, that it be a healing and that it be a something significant. And I don't really care how many people it hits or it doesn't hit, but that I be of, of, a, of a purpose. And so just like um, wanting to play music, people like Mark Johnson, like Michelle Obama, they bring me into their Sesame Street, they bring me into their fold, and then therefore my dream to be of consequence gets revealed by people like you, like yourself, bringing me into... You know, Dragged you right out of the elevator. Because <laughs> me, I mean me, of my own accord, I'm gonna get up every morning, I'm gonna make some music, and I'm gonna get up, I'm gonna have my breakfast, and I'm gonna have a, you know, and I'm just going to just well, hope you know, to do something good today. People, people approach all of us. Yeah. We're, people approach all of us or we read about opportunities and ways to make a difference. The, the difference is you say yes. You, know, you say yes. Always. And, always. And that's, that could be a problem. But, but, but if, if you keep saying yes all the time because you get so tired, you know, you work very, very hard. But, well, you're exercising I I, now, I, don't I understand. Really, I don't really work, people. <laughs> I play. Well, you mentioned, you, you mentioned Michelle Obama, yeah. and that, um, that you, mentioned the, uh, you mentioned the Johnson School of Excellence in Chicago, and then you're very involved with the Kennedy Center and Michelle Obama's Turnaround Arts Program, and um, that, uh, that started as part of the President's Committee for the Arts and Humanities. And um, seeing... Uh, seen Michelle um, up there. Do we have her? Yeah. Um, it reminds me of how we opened today with Barack Obama, and he was introducing you and James Taylor, um, where, you, where you sang together. And you didn't sing the blues together. You sang, um, I'm so lonesome I could cry, but Hank Williams' great classic, which is such a, you know, again, you just, you, you, could, you, have, you don't let yourself get uh, stereotyped. You're gonna. That's, you know, that's that's not me doing that. That's my love for all different kinds of music. Mm -hmm. That's for me always being open. You know, playing calypso. When I learned to play the guitar, my uncle taught me how to play guitar. First the song he taught me was, uh, you know, Jamaica Farewell. Oh, um, really? Da, and, uh, da, 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 down the way and the lights are gay and yeah. the sunlight yeah. early on the mountain top. So basically, I'm just an old folky at heart. <laughs> I grew up in Compton listening to Earth, Wind and Fire, Ray Charles and, yeah. and, um, and George Clinton and everything else. But I'm, all, I'm, I'm, I'm just a big old, I love everything. I grew, grew up in church listening to gospel. You know, you had to go to church. Yeah. And that's where, the, that's where the foundation is laid and that's where the mm -hmm. bar is set. So, and listening to country music and all the skill, I love, the, I love classical, I just love music. It's just music. Is the church, is the church background where you got the sense of hand it over? I love that song. Mm -hmm. Hand it over, hand it over, give yeah, it up, give where, it over. Yeah, I went to church uh, in Watts, mm -hmm. what, at the Beulah Baptist Church, uh, right there by uh, you know, the Will Rogers Park. I know where that is. Yeah. I went to Faithful St. Mark's on, um, a, I think it was a Century and Figueroa. Faithful St. Mark's Missionary yeah. Baptist Church of yeah. Watts, the faithful and friendly church where God is the, the featured attraction. Yeah. It was the whole thing. The whole, oh, yeah. They, they, it was all across the wall because they couldn't, they couldn't fit the whole title, That's you know, on, on the, little, the little marquee. So they put the whole thing. So they have, yeah. they have so church. So you understand that, yeah. They have, they have church there. Yeah. And that's where you, so your influences, it's fair to say, came from everything that you came across. Yeah. So I have a question for you. And this goes back to, again, President Obama at the very beginning was talking about American music and how it begins, how, you know, and, and it, from, from the people at the lowest level of the ladder to, you know, and, and how it, it became and found its way through all American music. Tom Piazza talked about um, how, you know, it, the, the, the call and respond of the voices in the cotton fields. Um, and then here we are, there you are, in the East Room of the White House. Right? 
And you could have chosen any song to sing. You got, you have uh, the president and the first lady, you have all these honored guests. And you could have picked a hand clapper or, a, or a, um, a funny song or one of your hits. And instead, you chose this song. Well, remember if you came when cotton was picked by hand down in Dixie under southern skies, working from sun to sun. And remember if you. Lightning from a whiskey stick Blown in the blues and the breeze Sweet magnolia trees Little church house upon the hill And I can hear the Delta calling From the light of a distant storm I can see my future, I can feel my past when Henry plays his steel guitar. I chose that song was um, that song is um, there's two reasons. Um, the first reason is that it's a it's a, the major influence of that song is Taj Mahal, whose name is Henry St. Clair Fredericks. And Taj Mahal wasn't there that day; he didn't get invited. So I felt like I needed to be there. He needed to be there. So I played that song. And also, that's a song that goes back into like. You talk about like cotton picked by hand, and also you didn't hear the second verse, but the second verse is something I don't know that people really pick up on. The second verse goes, uh, um, "Won't you take me back in time? You know, free me from this crime. You know, which is slavery. I have no shame, and I have no blame. So it's time for us to be moving on. So it's about taking, forgetting the past, even something big as slavery." or the Holocaust, or something that somebody that did to you and, the, and the, invoke the power of forgiveness in your life and let things go like that and just move on anyway and just forget about it. Because once, once you have achieved the freedom in your mind, you're free. I mean, I'm a free man. I've, I've freed myself. So I don't need to be freed by anyone else because I know I'm okay. I mean, I don't, I don't think I'm the greatest thing since, like, you know, sliced bread or anything. But I think I'm okay, and I'm, and I'm here, and I'm here to contribute, and I just don't, I'm not gonna drag a bunch of stuff around with me. So that's that song about, and it's like, to forgive the unforgiven, the, the, the thing that's actually unforgivable. Hmm. Yes, that's exactly right. Um, I'm gonna read something you, you said once. The true significance of the blues lies in it being a part of all other popular music. Turn on the radio and listen to anything top 40. The blues is in there just below the surface. The blues are that powerful. It nurtures us in a way that new stuff can't. It's always going to have a seat at the table. Um, are you hopeful? Are you hopeful for the future? Are, is, are, are the times current um, informing what you're writing right now? And, and are they hopeful songs? Uh, yes. Well, that's equivocal yes. I'm not going to do the political answer and dance mm -hmm. around. It's just yeah. a big old yes. Yes. Yeah, well, that's, you, we, we, I think we've established that you say yes a lot. So, um, yeah. uh, tell me about, you've, you, have, you have an album, you know, before we say goodbye. Can you tell me a little bit about your album? And then I'm going to ask you to finish with one song about home. Um, because it, it, it what, this is what I love. You're not political. You're just Keb Mo. 
you know, and you, you call it and sing it as you see it. So, so I, say, I say yes because, <laughs> I'm gonna play the song? Yeah. Okay. I, I say yes because um, I'm not saying yes to the person, the thing, I'm just saying yes to. To whatever the universe brings you. Yes, it's a bigger yes, it's not, it's not a, 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 I get so ticked with politicians, they never answer any questions. <laughs> So, but you do with your music. Lawyers and politicians, they don't answer anything. <laughs> I just tell you like it is. Okay, yes, no, it's real simple. So anyway, so um, this is a song. Um, I'm gonna play the whole song. I don't mind at all. Um. All right. This is um, a song. Now I get to promote my new album to y'all. I got a new album coming out. <laughs> but that's just humor, but more so than having a new album, it's, a, it's about really um, being of, a, of a, what do they call it? Um, yeah, uh, beneficial presence, as a Reverend, Reverend Michael Beckett says. He says, being a beneficial presence in the universe. So. So here we go. Luby came here from Mexico about three or four years ago, and the journey. Journey, journey was long. She got a job at a local factory, sent money back home to her family. She said, This is where I belong. This is my home. This is where.
This is my home. This is where I belong. La 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 This is my home This is where I belong This is my home One last thought from Tom Piazza that about you. What would American music sound like without the blues and Keb Mo? All American music would be an empty house without the blues. It would be a town without a river, a ship without a sail, a train without an engine. And by that measure alone, if no other, the blues will never die. It is perennial like the showers of rain and the sun that will surely follow. You give us so much sun. Thank you for coming. Thank you.